once again, everyone. This is an exciting day. God's doing some powerful things in a lot of people's lives today. You know, I, I have a special announcement to make. Um, but first, I'm gonna set the announcement up by saying this. This spring, we are gonna celebrate 20 years as a church body. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Yeah, Lori and I uh, planted this church in the spring of 2001, had uh, our first prayer meeting sometime in March, then had our first open service in the beginning of June, and God's worked really, really in, in exciting and powerful ways here. You know, the Vineyard Movement has long been known as a church planting movement. At the very beginning, that was part of the vision, and it still remains the vision. And that, that is because there are thousands of communities that need churches just like the vineyard. And at the time the vineyard started, there weren't very many other churches like us. Now there are a lot of other churches that are, are very similar to us. And so we're really thankful for that. But there are still communities that need good churches that, that take the same approach that uh, we do. Uh, one reason for that is, one reason church planting is so important is that more people come to faith in Christ, more people get saved and find Jesus in a church plant than any other vehicle of the church that, that we have to use, any other program or anything else. When you start a new church, there's just a cluster of people that come to faith in Jesus. And so it, the, the exciting thing that I want to announce right now is this, that in the year 2021, we as Vineyard Church Northwest, you could even say as part of our celebration, we are sending Sarah Anderson to plant a new church in Finneytown. Okay, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Sarah's had this on her heart for a lot, a lot of years and she's been preparing for several years and we've all come to believe that this is the right time for this to happen. And it's not the first time we planted a church. We were involved in starting a church in Guatemala. We're currently working in church planting in Zimbabwe. Uh, we sent Minor and Isis Cannell in, in uh, cooperation with Lavinia in LA to Price Hill. Uh, we as a church were the sending church for Dale and Wendy McMillan who are now in Dallas, Texas, uh, pastoring a church that they went there to start. But uh, now it's Finneytown. That's where our focus is gonna be. And uh, Finneytown is a unique community, has a diverse population, and uh, some, some unique things about it that make it a place that we believe is just a great place to plant a church. And Sarah is the right person to do that with her background, with, uh, with her heart, and with her gifting. And so let's welcome Sarah to the stage right now. Would you welcome her up here with me, please? Well, thank you. Good morning. Yeah, Finneytown. <laughs> Um, you guys may not know, but my kids are fourth generation Finneytowners. My family has been in Finneytown for many generations, and it's a community that's close to my heart. I've lived there for almost my whole life. Um, my husband is currently serving as one of the school administrators in Finneytown as well. Um, and I have been a part of this community, this Vineyard Northwest community, for 14 or 15 years. And so the DNA of Vineyard Northwest is deeply embedded in my heart. And so my hope is to take the DNA of this church and take it to the community where I have deep roots and really to see change for the kingdom of God come there. Uh, as Van said, Finneytown is a wonderfully diverse community and it's a small, special little place uh, that's close to my heart. So I've been hard at work behind the scenes. We have a logo. Vineyard Finneytown. We also have a website that we started, vineyardfinneytown.org. You can go there if you'd like to get more information about the church, about the vision and timeline and things that are going to be happening. And we've been working on just different practical and financial and legal matters, kind of to set the stage so that in the new year, we can start to gather some people to go and do this with us. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Sarah will be whole, Sarah's going to be speaking 
actually next Sunday, but she'll be speaking in mid-January where she just shares her vision and heart for Finneytown and church planting. And then uh, after that, we'll have three different information meetings so that anyone who's interested can learn how they can be part of and supporting this new church plant. And right now, I would see three main ways. You know, first of all, obviously pray. That's something we can all start doing right now. Second, give. You can give to this church plant, and we're going to um, have an offering. We're going to make that part of our 20-year celebration in April, and uh, we'll take up an offering for Sarah. But you can give to this now if, if uh, God puts that on your heart. And, of course, the third way and the thing that Sarah will be looking for will be people that when she shares her vision, it lights your heart up. And it excites you, and God says to you, I want you to be part of this. And so that's what we'll be looking for as Sarah gives her vision message and then those information meetings, is people that will be actually called by God to partner with her. And you get a group of people that have the same vision and mission and the, the call of God definitely on their hearts together, and the sky's the limit. And so uh, let's, just, let's just give it up for Sarah again. Bless her, bless you. Okay, we can leave. All right. Good morning, good morning. Uh, let's give it up one more time for Sarah, Grant, and their family. So excited, that is awesome. Well, good morning, Vineyard Northwest family. I'm Orlando, if we haven't met before. And we just wanna say welcome, especially those that are visiting us for the first time, uh, those joining in the live stream, we wanna say welcome to you. We're so glad that you're joining us today. So let's give them a round of applause. Yeah, we're excited you're here and we wanna be able to connect with you. So if you look behind me, there's a QR code that's gonna show up on the screen. If you just want more information about our church and an opportunity for us to connect with you and you to connect with us, just take a picture of that QR code. It's gonna take you to our website or you could go to vineyardnorthwest.org and then you'll get more information under the new here tab. And in a couple days, we'd like to send you a gift just to show our appreciation for you joining us today. So a couple announcements for uh, the next few weeks. Uh, the first is Light Up Vineyard Northwest. We, you know, we've mentioned this before, but December 20th at 4.30 p.m., we'd love to have you here with your family and your friends to just participate and representing your family uh, and yourself on our tree. Uh, the second is Christmas caroling. So Christmas carolers are going to be around the neighborhood going out in the evenings on December 22nd and 23rd. If you want to participate in that or just learn more information, check out the website as well. The last one is Christmas Eve service. So uh, in person or over the live stream, we're going to be hosting our Christmas Eve service at 7 p.m., and the service will last about an hour. It's family friendly. And then we understand that there may be some of you joining the live stream even today that uh, are, are taking your own pace in um, assimilating with uh, in-person gatherings. So if you want to participate in the Christmas Eve service from home through the live stream, we want to participate with you. So if you would just email sherry at vcnw.org, we'd love to sh send you a pre-packaged, uh, sanitized um, communion cup candle to light as we all sing Silent Night together, and then glow sticks for the kids just to participate with us. And again, enjoy just the Christmas season and what God is doing in our community, what he's done in the past, what he's doing in the future, okay? So we'd like to continue on our worship through the receiving of our offering. Many ways to give, easiest way is through the app, so I highly encourage you to check that out. But uh, would you stand with me as we do our offering declaration together? I am deeply loved by an amazing God. There is nothing I could ever do to earn or lose his love for me. I have a Father in heaven who provides for all of my needs. Because God is my provider, I walk in peace. I am a walking God moment. People get to know God when they get to know me. People are set free when I'm around them. God is excited to work through me as I go through life. Thank you, God, that in you we have everything we need, that we don't have to believe the lie, that we don't have this or that or there is something missing. 
We have everything we need through you. So God, I bless everyone here. I bless everyone joining us through the live stream, Lord. Even the people that weren't able to join us here today. God, I bless them, Lord. I proclaim just your provision over them, your protection over them, your goodness over them, God. And I pray all those things, Lord, over our community, Lord God, over this city, Lord, over this nation, and this world that is yours, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I welcome yeah. Van for the message. Thanks, Orlando. Well, good morning again. Um, I have a couple jokes for you this morning. They're really good ones, so get ready to laugh, all right? All right. <laughs> so there was a surgeon, an engineer, and a politician having dinner together, and they were arguing about what was the first profession. And the surgeon said, well, God took the rib out of Eve. That was surgery, so surgeon, you know, the surgeon was the very first profession. And then the engineer said, no, wait a second. He said, remember, the world was void and without form, it was in chaos, and God brought something beautiful out of the chaos. That was an incredible engineering feat. Well, the politician smiled and leaned back in his chair, and he said, fellas, who do you think created the chaos? <laughs> That's just too real, isn't it? It's nonpartisan. That was a nonpartisan joke. Okay, there was a young pastor that was talking to his church about preaching and get, trying to get feedback from them and had a, he had a, had, had a church meeting. And he said, all right, I wanna ask this question. In your opinion, does a good introduction and a good conclusion constitute a good message? And someone called out and said, if they're close enough together, <laughs> All right, I'm glad we don't feel that way around here. <laughs> We're going to talk about hope today, and um, hope as part of the gift of Christmas. It's part of what God gives us through sending his son Jesus in the world is hope. And hope is one of the most important things anyone can have. Actually, hope enables us to live in this world, but to, to live on the basis of the values and the power in the life of another world. And so hope connects us with the kingdom of God in a real living way so that we can live like Jesus and believe like Jesus. You know, uh, Steve Backlund said that believing in Jesus gets you saved. Believing like Jesus sets you free. And you might not have thought of that before, but Jim was talking about lies earlier that we can believe, and there's so many different lies we believe about our identity, about our value, our worth, about the potential for our lives. And what we need to do is to look at what the Bible says about all of that and believe God's truth, not what we were brought up with, not the voices from the past, uh, when, when we were growing up with other kids that were as insecure as we were, but believing what God says today. And that gives us hope. In 1979, I, I was graduating from seminary, and Lori and I were about to move from the seminary town, Warsaw, Indiana, to a, a suburb of South Bend, Indiana, where our first church was. And we had a baby due September 7th. And so we had prayed that God would enable us to move before the baby came. And this was at least August 7th. It was like into, into the second week of August in that range, less than a month to go before the baby's due. And I remember Lori saying, I hope we get to move before the baby comes. And I thought, Lori, honey, sweetie, well, there's no way we're gonna get to move before the baby comes. It could take us a month. We don't even have anyone making an offer on our house right now. And once we get the offer, it could take weeks for them to get approved and then, and then we have to buy a new house up there and get approved for a loan there. It's just not, it just can't happen. I'm telling you, within like two days after she said that, we got a call at 9.30 at night. Our realtor said, I have a couple in my office right now that wanna buy your house. They wanna give you the full asking price but we have to close the deal tonight. So it really gets, it gets even better than that. We go down and we talk to them 
and they say, yeah, we'll give you your full asking price. Money is no problem, but you have to be out by the end of this week. <laughs> so we said yes. So we moved everything into storage that we could, packed the garage full of stuff. They, they said that was okay to keep some stuff in the garage. But, but the next day, after we, we received this offer on the house, we traveled to the South Bend area and started, look, we'd been looking at houses, but we went back and looked at some of the houses we had already looked at. And then right before we, before we made an offer on one house, I thought there was this other house we ought to go look at one more time. And the realtor told us, well, that house has been vacated now. And that was back in the days when there was a, a real estate company that said, if we don't sell your house in, I don't know how long, three months, then we'll buy it from you. And so they, the, the company owned that house, and it was empty. And when we walked through it, looking at it empty, it looked totally different than it had when the family was there. And so we made an offer on that house, which was accepted immediately. And in two weeks and two days, we closed both deals. <laughs> and we had moved into the new house. I think God was in heaven looking down at me when I was telling Lori, silly girl, <laughs> this can't happen. And, and God was in heaven saying, silly boy, just, just. <laughs> she's trusting in me. She's putting her hope in me. And so just stand back and watch this. I think that's, that's, that, that, that's, that, that's an illustration of, of hope. You, hope is more than saying, I, you know, I hope we have a mild winter, or I wish for this, or I blew up, blow out the candles and make a wish. Or anything. It's, it's not that. Cross your fingers. Hope is in God. So hope is a substance. It is a substantial thing not just a whimsical thought that I have, although it might even be a great thought, but that I am wishing would happen. In fact, in the Old Testament, uh, one of the words that's used for hope originally started out meaning uh, to measure something, to stretch a line from one point to another point. It could be like a carpenter in the carpenter shop, or it could be someone measuring from here to the parking lot. But you take a line and you stretch it from here to there, a straight point. Now, that word came to, be, came to mean hope in, in Hebrew. And what the, the way it related was this, that you're stretching your mind and your heart into the future and attaching it to God. That's what hope is. To, it's stretching your mind and your heart into the future and attaching it to God. So it, here's a definition I would give. B biblical hope looks to the future and it sees God there. Okay, it looks to the future and it sees God there. It, you know, what does that mean, to see God there? Well, it's like God's there waiting for you. He's here, but he's there waiting for you. And he has a bushel full of promises for you. And he's waiting there for you in his goodness and in his power and his faithfulness and in his life and in his love and with a desire just to be so close to you. I have a good friend and a mentor of mine that said when he wakes up in the morning, he really believes the Lord is sitting on the edge of his bed just eagerly awaiting for him to wake up so they can spend time together. It's a pretty good picture, isn't it? But he's there waiting for you. He wants you to get there so that you can spend time together. And so maybe expand that definition just a little. And I would say biblical hope looks to the future with confidence because God is there. It looks to the future with confidence because God is there is there. Uh, 15 years after, after the story I just told you, we were living in Owasso, Michigan. And um, we, th that was where we had a big transition theologically from being opposed to the gifts of the Spirit to being open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so I had to resign the church I was at. And, and that, that was just an act of integrity on our part. We felt like we were the ones who had changed. They hired us under a totally different set of circumstances, so we're the ones that should bear the brunt of the change. So I resigned. We didn't know where we were going to go or how we were going to live, but we knew God was in it. And we were excited because it was like we had discovered God's alive today. He's still working today. And I remember one day when I was worried about the future, 
and thinking about that. And it was a lot of pressure because we had four kids that we had to feed and no job anywhere, didn't even know what city we were gonna move to at this point. And I remember thinking to myself, I, I thought back to other points in my life where I had been nervous about what was gonna happen next and how God had worked. And I thought, you know, five years from now, I'm gonna look back on this time, and I'm gonna say this was one of the most exciting times of our lives. Look how God worked, and I'm gonna be so filled with joy to look back and see everything that God did in our lives at this point in time. And, and I wanna tell you, what that did was that enabled me to reach into the future, grab hold of joy, and bring it back to today. That's another aspect of hope. It enables you to reach into the future, grab hold of joy, and bring it back into today. Because hope is your confidence, looking with confidence to the future because you know Jesus is there waiting for you. You know the Holy Spirit's there waiting for you and all of his power and life and goodness and the Father is there with open arms just saying, boy, come, come, come. Come with boldness, come with joy because I'm here. And so we all, we all need hope. We, we need, and, our, and our culture today needs hope so desperately. I, I believe this, those that have the greatest hope are gonna have the greatest influence. That's from Steve Backland. Those that have the greatest hope are gonna have the greatest influence. People who live with real hope are gonna be like magnets. People are gonna wanna know, where do you get your hope? How, how do you stay so positive? How, you know, how can you stay joyful in the midst of, of, of what's happening? And so this whole concept of hope is gonna be really key to the revival that's coming and to each of our lives, to our church's life as, as we look ahead to it. Now, Lamentations 3, verses 21 and 22 are a, a real powerful uh, verse here. Many of you have memorized this, I'm sure, over the years. But Lamentations is a book that the prophet Jeremiah wrote. And among of all the prophets, I think Jeremiah probably had the roughest job because he was the prophet during the years that the nation of Israel, both north and southern kingdoms, uh, just declined in, in, um, in morality. Morally, they declined. Spiritually, they abandoned the Lord. And they're just falling further and further and further away from God. And so that's a pretty rough job to have to be the prophet in a setting like that. But one of the things he, he had to tell them was, look, judgment's coming. And in the Old Testament era, that was just a big part of how things functioned. And we're, we're under a different covenant today. And when a person receives Jesus, they get a new heart. And so that new heart is what God deals with. He doesn't deal with the outward as much. He deals primarily with the new heart that we get. And so, but, but Jeremiah is telling them that. And what happens is the nation of Babylon, uh, the kingdom of Babylon comes down and conquers Jerusalem. After a long siege where thousands of people starved to death, the, the, the nation was conquered and they carried off all of the uh, educated, wealthy people. All they left was the poorest of the poor in Palestine. And so Lamp Jeremiah stayed in, 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 uh, in Israel. And as he's there, he's still, he's still prophesying. And he writes this book called Lamentations, his lament over what had happened to Israel. And his broken heart, he just shares his broken heartedness in that book. But he also shares tremendous hope in that book. And here's one of the things he says in Lamentations. And so you have to understand the context, okay? The context of the nation falling apart, the nation declining morally and spiritually and ethically, the nation just everything going bad there, and now actually being carried off into captivity. And Jeremiah writes this, and he says this, he says, it's as if he's saying, look, when I, when I think about all of this, bottom line is this, I recall this to my mind. This is what it is, therefore I have hope. I recall this to my mind, therefore I have hope. And here's what he recalls. The Lord's mercies never end, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. He says, I remember, Lord's mercies never end. His compassions never end. His faithfulness never ends. It all is recycled every day. Every day you get up, it's brand new. Brand new experience. It's all there fully for you. It's not like he's expended so much of it over the last 2,000 years he doesn't have any left. 
It's not diminished by what he gave you yesterday. It's there in its fullness every day when you wake up. So he's saying tomorrow, it's all there. The day after that, God's there in his mercy and his compassion. Because he says every day, he says they're new every morning. A week from now, they're brand new. A month from now, a year from now, five years from now, God doesn't change. God's mercies are new. And, and, and God is there. Jesus will lead you. The Holy Spirit will be there to empower you. He will be there to guide you, give you wisdom for how you are to conduct your life. He will be there in his presence, giving you his love and his reassurance of his goodness continually. And th this, this is so important. And, and it was so important for the Jews that had been carried away into captivity. Uh, Daniel, who was one of the prophets of the Old Testament, he lived in Babylon. He was carried away into captivity, and that's, that's where he lived. He lived in a, pagan, in a pagan kingdom. He served a pagan king and, and that was not friendly towards his religion. And yet, Daniel thrived, because that's part of the confidence of hope is that even if the worst happens, I'll still be okay. Even if the worst happens, I'll thrive, because God's with me because Jesus is gonna be there. And so Daniel here in Babylon, he thrives and rises to leadership because of his absolute integrity and the spiritual gifts that God had put into him. So Joseph, another illustration from a different era, Joseph sold into slavery by his brothers, betrayed by family, becomes a slave. Then, then he becomes, he's accused by his master's wife of having made improper advances to her. All a lie. Thrown into prison. He's in prison. Uh, the, one of the king's close associates is thrown in prison. And then he is cleared of all charges. And he goes back into his job. And, and, and Joseph says, hey, remember me when you get back there beside the king. Whisper my name into his ear. And he goes back and he forgets. Forgets all about Joseph. And so Joseph is facing all of this, uh, all of these, this onslaught of attacks against him. But Joseph thrived. Do you know that? Joseph thrived in that situation because he kept his heart with Jesus. He kept his heart with the Lord. And he had, he had this confidence in God's presence with him so that everybody around him recognized he was someone special. Even when he was thrown into prison, he became the chief prisoner in charge of all the other prisoners. And so here's the thing. We look to the future with confidence because God's gonna be there with us. And I believe the future is gonna be good. I believe the future is gonna be better than the present, and I have power to help make it that way. That's another Steve Backlund statement. I believe the future is gonna be better than today, and I have power to help make it so. But even if it's not, I'm gonna thrive. If I have to thrive as a Daniel, or as a Joseph, or as an Esther, then I'll thrive as a Daniel, or a Joseph, or an Esther. And that invitation is to each one of you as well. Just put your hope in God. Our hope is in God. And I look to the future and I say, he's gonna be there so it's gonna be okay. And there are gonna be good times in the future. Don't get me wrong, I believe there will be. But even if the worst happens, I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna thrive because he's there waiting for me. And his promises are, are sure and never end. Now Jeremiah said something else in, in the book of Jeremiah, verse 20, chapter 29 and verse 11. And he's writing here to some of the captives in Babylon. And he's saying to them, basically, you know, this bad stuff has happened, horrific things have happened, but God's still faithful, God's still good. And here's what God says to them. God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare and not for calamity, that you might have a future and a hope. And so there's, there's always this looking ahead, seeing God there, and that gives me hope. And I walk in hope because hope is living with confidence, looking into the future because I see God there. I think that's how Mary responded to the angel as she did, just to tie this into Christmas a little here, the Christmas story. But you know when the angel came to Mary and said, you know, all these things are gonna happen to you and on and on, you're gonna have a baby and it's Holy Spirit and name Jesus and et cetera. And Mary says, how can these things be? And the angel says, 
Uh, nothing's impossible with God. And Mary says, behold the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be to me as you've spoken. When she said that, you realize she was giving up dreams. She was giving up the dream of having her first child with Joseph. Gone. She was giving up the dream even of having a relationship with Joseph because she didn't know how he's gonna respond to this. And as we know, at first he responded, uh, you know, poorly. She's giving up the dream of living her life as a life of integrity and not having anyone question that because now there are questions. And do you know that even in the ministry of Jesus, there was a time Jesus was contending with the Pharisees and you know, they could never win arguments with him. And so at the end of the argument, they, they, they say, well, at least we're not born of fornication. Do you know what? They had sent people to investigate Jesus' life and they had talked to neighbors and people who were alive when he was born and they shared with them the questions about Mary. And so she lived with that as a shadow over her life for the rest of her days. Then that, this, on top of all of that, the census, she doesn't know it's gonna happen yet, but she remains faithful through that. This census where she's nine months pregnant and she's gonna take a 90 mile ride on a donkey through some of the roughest terrain you can imagine. You know, how many of you women would like to do that? I mean, how many mothers here would say, boy, that sounds like the ideal. As long as my midwife's there. As long as my midwife is there, I'd be okay. But she was leaving her midwife. She was leaving her mother. She was leaving her aunts and other family friends that would have helped her deliver this baby. So she's walking away from all of that because she knows that God's in the future. She's looking ahead. She's saying, if God, if you're in this, then I'm for it. God, you're good, you're faithful, I love you, I trust you without question, and if you're in it, then I'm for it, I'm good with it. And th that's, that's how hope enables us to make decisions, because we know God's there, and we, we can follow God without question. Well, this whole story of hope extends to the world. In, in Romans 15, 12, we read this. Isaiah, he's quoting Isaiah here, and he says, the root of Jesse, which is one of the names for Jesus, the Messiah, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations, and in him the Gentiles will hope. So most of us in this room, I suspect, are Gentiles. Some of us might be of Jewish heritage, and if that's the case, wonderful. But most of us are Gentiles, and Jesus came to give us hope so that we could live with hope by coming to know God through him. And this, this coming to know God through him then becomes our mission to carry on so that others can come to know God through him. And having a life of hope is part of the key to the whole thing. In fact, the very next verse, he says this in Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's called the God of hope. God of hope, that means God himself, part of his nature is hope. You know, even when you don't have any hope for yourself, he has hope for you. He's in heaven saying to the angels, yeah, look at my son down there. He's, he doesn't really see himself as I see him. He doesn't really understand what I've done in his life. He doesn't even understand the future I have for him. He's, he's, he's pretty depressed right now, not living with much hope. But you know what? I know what's coming. He's the God of hope. And so what uh, Steve Backlund said this, he was worried once and God spoke to him and said, you know, you can be hopeless about anything I'm hopeless about. Okay? You can be, I give you permission to be hopeless about anything God says that I am hopeless about. And he's the God of hope. So there's no hopelessness in him at all, none at all. Now, he says, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing. This uh, joy and peace are part of what God wants us to have in our lives. It is part of what the God of hope gives to us, joy and peace. He wants to fill us right up to the brim with joy and peace. But he says, in believing. And so the believing part is this. It's kind of like, you know, kind of like maybe think of our hearts as being leaky. Think of our hearts as having leaks. 
So God pours joy and peace in, and it just leaks out. It's gone. Well, believing is like the liner that secures your heart so that when the joy and peace comes in, it doesn't all just drain out. You get that? It's like the liner of our hearts. Uh, well, we just visited our second born son, Brent, in his family in North Carolina, and it reminded me of a time when Brent was about nine years old. Brent, if you're listening to this, love you, really proud of you, and uh, your, your beautiful wife, Becca, and your kids, Kella, and Bronnie, and um, Lucy. But uh, Brent's about nine years old, and he wanted to uh, landscape our front yard. He wanted to put a pond in. <laughs> and so we, um, we dug a hole. We got rocks to line around the pond and everything, and put the tarp in it that I had, and you know what? It all leaked through. So we tried something else, and it still leaked through. And, something else. and honestly, in those days, we just did not have the money to run to the hardware store and say, what will work? Okay, here's the cash. Give it to me. Let's put a liner in this thing that will hold. Everything leaked through because it was porous. And faith is the thing, believing, trusting in God is the liner in your hearts that keeps it from leaking through. Now, I gotta tell you this, Brent now has a beautiful pond. Well, he had a pond, but now he has a stream in his backyard, and he found the right stuff to put down in the ground so that, so that it all doesn't just leak away in, into the ground. But hear this, that faith, trusting in God, confidence in him, Believing in him is what enables you to contain and maintain joy and peace. But that's not enough. He wants more. He wants more than joy and peace. He says, all of that so that you can overflow with hope. Now, with joy and peace, he wants to fill us with those, but hope he wants us to be overflowing in. And that comes back to, to this whole notion that the world needs hope so badly, so desperately that the world needs people in it who are overflowing with hope. So that everywhere we go, there's hope just flowing out. Hope flowing out. I've, I've told you this before, but a good friend of mine, Happy Layman, and a key mentor in my life uh, said this. He said, you know, Van, he said, when I enter a room, I really believe the room gets better. Not because Happy is a great guy, but because Happy has Jesus in him. And, and happy has faith that's containing peace and joy and exuding hope. And so when you walk into a room, the, the person with the most hope controls the atmosphere. The person with the most hope is going to have the most influence. Did you know that? Because people want to follow someone with hope. Who wants to follow with someone who says, oh, woe is me, everything's lost, there's no hope, there's no sense in even trying, Oh, I want to follow you. Where? where? <laughs> but if a person has hope, then they're looking ahead in life and they're moving ahead in life. And so to increase your influence in the world and your influence in the lives of other people, begin to live with hope. Begin, begin to change some of the lies that you're thinking and begin to live with hope. I believe this, the person with the most hope has the most creativity most potential for creativity because fear clouds our thinking. Fear confuses us. When you live with hope, your mind is free and you can hear from God. And you can, you know, God's creative, so don't ever say you're not creative. How many here have said, I'm not creative? I've said that before many times. You're creative, you're, you're created in the image of God and he's a creator. Living with hope expands your creativity. Person with the most hope is gonna see the most healings. Person with the most hope is gonna see the most people freed. So in 2 Timothy, Timothy says we have fixed our hope on the living God. What that tells me is that hope is something that you get to put where you wanna put it. And it's not just something that happens. Everyone puts their hope somewhere. You can put your hope in the economic forecast. You can put your hope in a philosophy, in politicians, in doctors, in scientists, and, and on and on the list goes. But where's your hope? Here, let me give you an illustration of what I mean by that. My grandfather Van Dyke, on my mother's side of the family, um, 
he, in his later years, first had what they called hardening of the arteries in his brain. Then, then, then I think at that time even um, Alzheimer's was known about. But uh, eventually they called it Parkinson's disease, but it was something in that range. And sp- specifically, I zeroed in on Alzheimer's, as, especially as I became more and more known. And I thought, wait a second, I've got that guy's genetic code in me. I wonder if that's going to happen to me someday. You know, I'm, I'm talking about when I was a real young man, probably early 30s. And you know what I thought? I thought to myself this. I thought, by that time, the scientists will have figured out a cure for it. Okay? Where was I putting my hope? In science. Did they, did they come through for me? No. I put my hope in the wrong place. I should have been saying, hey, you know what? God's in charge of my future. I should have said, you know what? I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to live a healthy life. And, and even if the worst happens, I'm going to thrive. But I don't think that's going to happen. Do you know why? Because I have promises from God. In his word, he talks about healing and he talks about life. And more recently, I just got a prophetic word that I'm going to live healthy to the end of my days. And I'm going to be active to the end of my days. And then the prophet who gave me this word said, you're going to die like a man running off the edge of a cliff. And so I believe that. I, that's where my hope is in God, not in any scientific test or study or anything like that. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, science has obviously done such <coughs> man, just fantastic things for us. And none of us would live as long as we are if there wasn't medical science available and today and all of that. So, but that's not where I want to put my trust or my hope. My hope is in God. And so we, we fix our hope. We choose where we're going to put our hope. And so fix your hope on God. Picture yourself five years from now, finally getting there. And when you walk in the door, Jesus is sitting there with whatever you like, maybe a nice cup of coffee or tea or a shot of whiskey or whatever it is you would envision being a really great way to be welcomed, okay? (laughs) Whatever you think would be a wonderful way to be welcomed. Jesus is sitting there at the kitchen table saying, hey, I prepared this for you. Come on in, let's talk. He's there. And He's waiting for you. He's going to be there with you no matter what. Now, just to end here quickly, um, two aspects of hope. Hope in the next life and hope in this life. And you know, in the vineyard, we don't talk enough about hope in the next life because we're so focused on the kingdom coming now. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're so focused on that that we kind of minimize the whole idea of what the Bible calls the blessed hope. And, and, and so in, in, the, in that day, John, in 1 John says, we'll see him as he is. We will see him as he is in the fullness of his glory. And when Peter, James, and John saw Jesus in, in his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration, what did they want to do? They want to say, Let, this is weird. Let's get out of this place. Let's get out of here. No, Peter wanted to build huts for all of them and just stay there. He never wanted to leave. It was so enthralling, it was so beautiful, it was such a, such a wonderful, incredible experience, he didn't want to leave. So sometimes people will ask me questions like, will I get to go fishing in heaven? You know what my answer is? If when you get to heaven, you wanna go fishing, you still wanna go fishing, then yeah, I'm, I'm guessing you'll get to go fishing, if you still want to. But when you are like Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration, you might not be thinking about fishing once you get there, okay? <laughs> Maybe not. But the Bible says that he'll wipe away every tear from our eyes. There'll be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And the one seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. That's the blessed hope. It's coming. It's coming. And you get there one of two ways, okay? You get there either by dying or by being alive when Jesus returns. Either by dying or being alive when Jesus returns. And if you die, you, you, your body stays here, we bury it, but you go, you're, you're, you're the essence of who you are goes, goes to heaven and, and, and to be with the Lord. But when Jesus returns, you know what's gonna happen? The bodies are gonna be raised from the dead. The bodies, the very bodies that we bury here. There are bodies that were cremated here. God knows where those atoms are. 
And he can gather enough of them to say, okay, I'm creating a new body. So it's going to be the very body that you have now, just like Jesus went into the tomb with an earthly body. He came out with an eternal body. He came out with what's called, a, theologically we would call it a glorified body. So it's a body fit for heaven. These bodies aren't really suited for heaven. Something has to happen. It has to change. There has to be a change. And so when Jesus returns, it says the dead in Christ will rise first. I've often thought I want to be near a graveyard when that happens. You see the graves busting open and, and people flying up into the sky. You get ready to go next because it says the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air together with them forever to be with the Lord. That sounds good, doesn't it? So... Two ways to get to heaven. Either you die or you're alive when Jesus returns and, and, and you're changed. Now, there's hope in the next life, but there's hope in this life. And that's the primary thing I'm focusing on. But hope in the next life gives you hope in this life, doesn't it? Hope in the next life gives you hope in this life. So hope in this life. Psalm 27, 13, and 14 are two verses that are key to this. It, it, the psalmist says, I would have despaired if I hadn't believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Okay, when you're going through hard times, you look to the future and you see Jesus there and you say, I'm going to experience the goodness of God in this lifetime. It's not going to be just heaven someday. I'm going to experience God's goodness here in the land of the living. So hope, uh, I, I want to leave you with, with this, these, these thoughts that hope is looking into the future with confidence because I see God there. And because I fix my hope on something, now we can say this, I see God there and I fix my heart to him. I'm attaching my heart to him. He is my hope. And when we think of that, hope says no matter what happens in the future, I'll be Okay. No matter what happens, I'll be more than okay. I will thrive. I will thrive because Jesus is going to be in me. And it might be that if things don't turn out the way I want them to, stripping all some of the stuff off of me might just move my heart into a deeper, closer relationship with him. And that that's how I'm going to thrive. But we need to live with hope, folks. Okay, we need to live with hope. That's why Jesus came. Would you stand with me? Father, <clears throat> I just sense that you want to just deposit hope in our hearts right now, kind of like, like priming the pump, where you fill the pump up so the pump can start working. For some of us, Father, we just need to have the pump primed. So, Father, I ask in Jesus' name, just supernaturally pour out hope into hearts. And if you really need that, kind of like the pump being primed, you know what I mean by that. You, you, need, you need to just get a jump start on this. Just hold your hands out, and I'm just gonna pray in Jesus' name, I release hope to you. In Jesus' name, in the power of the Holy Spirit, I release hope to you. A deposit of hope right now into your hearts and minds and lives. lives. That's gonna keep on flowing, and, and hope is gonna keep on flowing in your life. It's gonna keep on flowing from this moment on, and when you hit hard times or when you start to lose hope, you're gonna come back to this day and you're gonna remember, no, my heart's attached to God. He's in the future waiting for me, and I'm living with hope. So I release that to you right now in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.